Well then, it'll be a great pleasure to invite Stanny to share with us the uh, decentralization journey or like the, the case study going deep into the governance for Aave and the approach you have taken and trade-offs and challenges that you are thinking. Over to you, Stanny. Hey everyone, uh, happy to be here to share some uh, experience, uh, kind of like what, how was the um, the journey of the to, to kind of like team team focused uh, deployment of contracts uh, into what we have now a decentralized governance and and protocol owned uh, by the community. Uh, what's interesting about of as a community and as a project is that we. Uh, we we started to build uh, our very first protocol back in uh, 2016, 2017, and uh, during that time we we first focused on just creating um, proof of concept smart contracts and just building uh, community around our first iterations. That was time before uh, DeFi was what even as a term and, and <laughs> there wasn't much of a composability or uh, DeFi protocols uh, at that moment. And at some point uh, we, we started to create, um, as we saw that the community started to grow more, uh, we were thinking like how we could uh, empower the community and get them more involved and be part of what we're building. And we pretty much decided to uh, distribute uh, governance power but in the beginning, what was uh, different is that we we still wanted to keep uh, uh, the uh, the deployments and and the governance of the uh, protocol still in the hands of the team in the very uh, beginning, which is uh, quite normal. And pretty much like the main reason everyone is doing this, and uh, especially lending protocols, is that. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, risk involved in terms of, uh, let's say, if there's some sort of like a technical uh, issue, uh, let's say uh, some sort of a, uh, error in the in the smart contracts or or the economics that has been uh, implemented. Uh, the the dif difficulty is that if if there is funds in in the protocol and if if the governance is from the day one, what happens is that it's very difficult to actually go and uh, mitigate those kind of like a security vulnerabilities if, if those happens. And especially as, as kind of like a DeFi protocols are growing quite a lot. Uh, there's currently, uh, I think roughly 13 billion worth of uh, value locked in the Aave protocol itself. It's the biggest uh, DeFi protocol at the moment. Uh, and, and in total 21 billion, including like the, the accounting uh, measures. So including the the collateral in the protocol, but also the, the borrowed funds that is owned back to the protocol. So in, in that sense, uh, the the governance aspects and 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 how you go from let's say, uh, would say like team owned uh, building into something where uh, the protocol is governed by the community and and also any improvements to the protocol is done by the the community and voted upon. The governance uh, is very uh, crucial crucial. Uh, journey and and what we found especially like for lending protocols uh, we we try to uh, intensively mitigate any kind of uh, technical risks in, involved there and also kind of apply uh, governance minimization wherever we can because governance as a tool is uh, is to some extent uh, uh, also like burdensome because you have a process of how you get things changed into the protocol. So what we try to usually do is that we we try to uh, let most of the kind of like a heavy lifting in in the protocol and, and changes related to that uh, done by more of uh, mathematics. So let's say that we don't change interest rate formulas uh, by governance on a periodic basis. Instead, we we have a a certain type of interest rate formula that is based on the market conditions, supply and demand, and and for example this. Allows, uh, allows us actually to have less governance involvement on, on changing uh, that uh, kind of like a interest rate formula. And then if there is some sort of market conditions that are unexpected, then the governance can come and, and change actually that particular formula. So we try to apply governance minimization uh, wherever we, we, we can. 
but in certain aspects it's not doable for example when it comes to asset listings and uh, assessing risks of, of those different different kind of assets let's say if there's a new asset that that the community wants to 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 list there's particular uh, peculiarities that we need to review from risk perspective such as the liquidity risk uh, uh, technical risk of that particular asset and and also the the the, the market risk and those kind of things uh, you kind of require human involvement and you can't leave for mathematics or have governance minimization in, in that part to to have uh, you know kind of like a, a scalability on on asset listing and what we actually done with the other communities we created this risk framework which actually means that uh, anyone from the other community can actually uh, suggest an asset to be listed but with the conditions of they review the, uh, the risk framework and, and apply it in a way that uh, that reflects uh, th the risk parameters of that, that new asset reflects the, the risk framework. And if it's aligned, it's it most likely the community will vote that assets into the uh, system. And this is like a very interesting way where you have uh, open community uh, managing a risk of the protocol, which is, um, Fascinating because end of the day, these protocols vary in the future pretty much like how they manage the risk. So if there is other protocol, there is maker protocol, for example, and we both have completely different kinds of uh, risk uh, dynamics there. So that's that's kind of like a key component. Like we try to like we try to use governance as least as possible, mainly for the reason of 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 the the process is quite uh, uh, burdensome. Uh, and, and try to leave everything that we can in for uh, mathematics and automatization, but where actually you need human involvement, their community-based uh, approach with, with the governance is very good solution. And one of the newest things that we see is, uh, understood uh, during this process is that some of the functions still need uh, human involvement and, and, and community uh, governance, but uh, you might need just some less burdensome mechanisms. And that might be, for example, grants. Uh, if you have a uh, grants program in, in your community, you might not want to have like the, the same voting process as you would vote, let's say, an assets in, a, a new asset into the protocol, change the risk parameters, or upgrade a uh, current version of the protocol to something new. Instead, you might just want to uh, kind of like a um, uh, do decision making in more robust way. So what we have done is that we started to create now sub DAOs, and one of the first sub DAO uh, is the uh, Arbit Grants DAO, which actually created one big proposal to to the uh, <coughs> the main Arbit DAO, and meaning that uh, they requested funds a certain amount uh, so that they can actually further uh, give those. Uh, funds in form of uh, grants to the applicants that has been accepted. And this kind of like a pro process uh, gives more flexibility and then you don't need all the token holders to, to oh, I mean, the threshold of the token holders to uh, vote upon, let's say, smaller things like grants uh, or let's say some sort of promotional uh, efforts within the community or educational content and, and related to finance, uh, for example, and financing those uh, efforts. So that's a kind of like a model that we we have followed, and uh, I would say the, the 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 challenging part for us now is to think, uh, let's say, how in the future the the protocol can be uh, let's let's say up, upgraded into a newer version because innovation is constant, right? So uh, even if you have a uh, protocol that has protocol market fit doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that will be always the case. So you have this constant innovation cycle where you have to keep up with, especially in decentralized finance, it's, it's uh, very much uh, quick in the sense because we have an open environment, everyone can look at your code and actually fairly quickly uh, take your code and improve it and, and create another protocol that might have more efficiency and, and that attracts more liquidity. In that sense, we're thinking now like, how we can actually uh, deploy new protocols and do it safely at the same time uh, and, and without kind of like a, having to actually then uh, 
keep any kind of like a administrative keys uh, by the team or have some sort of like a community-based uh, key management in, in, in that sense. And in terms of the actual uh, tactical things related to governance, uh, I would say like governance participation is, is fairly good in the other protocol there isn't that much like controversial votes uh mainly because our governance has been structured in a way that before you usually create a aip so the ava improvement proposal uh first thing you actually are doing is that you create so-called requests for comments into the uh, governance forum governance.ava.com that generates kind of like discussion and gives a bit of time for the community to digest the proposal and what this essentially allows us to do is that uh, you can temperature check the uh, the, uh, the the proposal and and see how the community reacts. And if there's positive reactions there, uh, there's uh, likely a chance that that proposal will succeed and and goes into the uh, AIP part where you actually create on-chain code, and at the same time, then you put the the proposal on chain for voting for the governance. And, and this is kind of like important because uh, it says resources of not creating proposals that doesn't have uh, success in, in the future. And at the same time, one of the interesting things about other governance is that uh, necessarily don't need to be a token holder to put proposals on chain. So we, we have not only uh, vote delegation so that you can delegate votes to let's say so-called uh, protocol politicians, but you could, for example, delegate also proposition power separately from voting power to developers that can create proposals. This essentially creates a uh, institutional mechanism where uh, you have so-called like code lawmakers creating those proposals and then pro protocol politicians voting on them. This is some, some kind of like an interesting uh, dynamic that we want to see grow in the future. Now we're trying to also figure out like how we can incentivize uh developers to actually kind of like a great DAOs where they 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 get the delegation a proposition power delegation and they craft those proposals uh maybe against some sort of uh, incentive or some some particular uh relationship and and then kind of like have the separability of of who create the the code and who vote on the on 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 the uh code and that's that's pretty much like what what is happening uh, recently and of course like the gas fees are one of the issues and and of course like Aave itself is a uh, cross-chain uh, environment so we we have the main layer one market but then we have also the market in in, in polygon uh, in Matic and we always try to deploy in, in wherever we can actually so be as inclusive as possible when it comes to the markets and, and infra infrastructure we have and what we're doing working now is that we are creating a governance bridge, uh, which means that you can on layer one vote on, on decisions on the Matic market. So you vote on layer one, and then with the governance bridge, those decisions are propagated into the Matic and executed. And then doing the same vice versa so that you can vote in Matic and they're propagated into uh, the layer one. And this could be interesting because it decreases the 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 actually participation cost on the governance with the gas fees and the gas fees is actually something that we have received feedback that you know it's quite costly to 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 vote on these proposals and and it definitely kind of like limits the uh scope of participating on on these proposals uh so that's kind of like a thing we are trying to solve and of course like we support uh snapshots as well so that's one option you basically vote uh, off chain and someone just puts the the actual result on chain and, and then you have different kinds of like fraud prevention mechanisms to uh, deal if, if the proposal isn't uh, legit. And also like the peculiar part about other governance itself also is that uh, the you can vote itself on the token economics and, and the, the token itself. So the ERC-20 is upgradable, but with a higher, higher, uh, way higher threshold. So you need uh, pretty much 20% uh, of the total supply to make any kind of changes. And this is important because uh, we know by our kind of like a previous understanding is that there will be always innovation in the token level itself. And if if you are able to upgrade the token in the future with, with your community, it means that you don't need to do any kind of like a token migrations in the future. 
and and you can just innovate on the token level itself as well. And good example is how tokens have uh, governance tokens changed over time. Is that uh, like during last year, many of the tokens have uh, vote delegation, which didn't exist previously. And if your token didn't have that, that means that that means that you have to migrate your token from to a completely new ERC twenty. It's just a technicality, but just show showcases like things that you need to consider when you uh, build and, and, and have governance and, and uh, token-based governance in a uh, uh, ecosystem which moves uh, very quickly. Yeah, and I, I guess like one of the things that we are trying to also achieve is that we as a community members, like leaders, are trying to act more be more active in voting, uh, not just in, in the other governance, but let's say in synthetics governance and, and other uh, protocols and the idea here actually is that we believe at Aave that uh, you know governance will be inclusive in the future. So even in some of the markets in Aave, you could vote with other tokens uh, where you know there is some sort of a relevance. For example, we deployed AMM market where you can use Uniswap Balancer and um, uh, future in the future Sushi Swap uh, liquidity tokens as a collateral. So it will be interesting, for example, to give some. Uh, voting rate to let's say those tokens and also to uni bell and, and sushi tokens and kind of like create more inclusive uh, governance environment because that's probably the the direction we're heading towards uh, besides that uh, this is pretty much uh, from from obvious part and and if, if there's any questions now or later thank you so much Stani. Stani, if, I, if i may one of the areas that is still i to me i think underdeveloped maybe for good reason, is the whole idea of like incentivizing kind of like coming up proposals or incentivizing even voting or engagement uh, because it's a bit tricky to do, right? You don't want to kind of like reward something and then that ends up encouraging some weird behavior. Uh, how do you think about this? Is there kind of, is this even a problem? Is there actually voter apathy or lack of engagement or, or you know, is it enough already? Uh, and if so, do we still need some sort of like rewards or incentives to do so? Yeah, I think like uh, I guess like the the base layer of, of whole governance has been that uh, across the census finance and Web three is that you you pretty much try not to incentivize like monetarily because you want to have governance where you have like other kind of uh, incentives driving you towards uh, pretty much uh, running the agenda or supporting different agendas. But in my opinion, uh, now that that's done, like one of the next things to experiment is actually try to experience on the level of like, what about if we actually incentivize some sort of uh, 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 participation on the voting level and the and especially in the, the kind of like a crafting of the uh, on-chain proposals, the payloads itself, because those are very costly. And I think uh, if you look at governments, for example, now, uh, you know, if you are, if you, if, if you get into a, a government, a body where you have, uh, uh, voting abilities, uh, you're, it's, it's pretty much like a paid position. And I can imagine the future, uh, if you reach certain amount of uh, vote delegations, uh, what happens is that based on that, uh, you will be able to get some sort of like a cash flow from the, from the protocols and that will kind of like a, uh, create this kind of like a competition that you are getting more proposition power or some sort of a voting activity. So that's the kind of like a uh, development that could happen. And I think someone will pretty much come with some sort of experimentation. We haven't done it in, in the other community that much uh, towards this direction, but I think this could be a very interesting way to get uh, more professional, uh, uh, more, more professional and more active uh, governance. It's a good, good actually topic. Yeah, yeah, and still a lot like largely unexplored, right? Like the idea of professional politicians who are maybe deeply involved or maybe even uninterested so that they can make an objective decision somehow on, for example, token economics uh, one way or the other. Uh, yeah, uh, if I may, uh, Marta has a question here uh, that she has typed on in chat. How do you think we are, do you think you are done and how do you know that you are done with the decentralization and autonomy? I guess in, in like the setup of the governance structures. Yeah, it's a good question. I guess you're never kind of done. I mean, decentralization itself is a cost and and like what's the balance of how much cost you add in terms of security and this for decentralization. 
and how much you actually need it. And uh, you know, you can decentralize things very widely. So let's say every token holder needs to participate to vote on every decision making or cap delegations and snapshot that that basically someone puts on chain and you have this kind of optimistic governance. But in terms of like uh, what's what's uh, important is that once you get certain aspects of decentralization, there's always risk of centralization again. So it's kind of like a balance all the time that is moving. And I, I guess like if you look at back in, in you know governments and you know economies and and how we have structured things, and even if you look at decentralized finance, uh, end of the day, uh, the, where you have actual places where you have most of the capital. Uh, that at attracts like the rest of the capital and, and governance power. So we have this kind of like a dilemma that, you know, of concentrations all the time. So how do we ensure that, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the token holders of the committee member will always kind of like try to uh, honor the opinions of minorities. It works pretty well compared to traditional finance and economies uh, because in, in DeFi, for example, in Web3, uh, all the code is pretty much uh, open source, which means that you can take the code and fork it and create a new community if you're not happy. Kind of similar way, for example, if you look at Linux ecosystem, if you're not happy the way people are building things, you can fork, uh, fork the software and create your own community. And this kind of like creates a bit of pressure of, of uh, ensuring that you have wide enough consensus in your uh, community. That could be like a substantial differentiator what we have seen previously where you know governments or or any kind of plug like bodies have seen decentralization but goes back into uh, centralization. So there's two things there. It's it's basically the, the, the balance and also how much decentralization you actually need to, to be sufficiently decentralized. I didn't catch one thing about how do you deal with um, auditing of the smart contracts? Because you have a lot of things put in place, a lot of break points put in place if it turns out that the contract was malicious or there was a bug or something. But I'm wondering, you know, how do you deal with actually before it's even voted on? You ver do you verify? Do you, does, is there like a subcommittee that is just responsible for security? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because like we what we are leaning towards is that we will have so-called payload DAO, one of the sub DAOs that is actually uh, creating creating the, the payloads, but also uh, reviewing third party payloads. And of course, like every payload should be uh, audited. And, and this is very important because even if it's a uh, some sort of like a risk, you know, parameter change, it's important to audit. Uh, but also kind of like the, the, the challenge is that the community needs to somehow uh, ensure what's, what's sufficient auditing and what's, what are the sufficient procedures of creating safe and secure code. Uh, because that's the, one of the most difficult things to do is, is to build smart contracts that can hold billions and in the future trillions of dollars worth of uh, value uh, without breaking. And... Uh, how we do it, Aave, we, we focus quite a lot on security, but we do it internally. So we tend not to leave uh, the security or delegate it to auditors because we know their job is just to basically review the code and see if there's any kind of like a uh, logical thinking that we didn't come up with or maybe some sort of, a, uh, some sort of like a, you know, maybe like a other kind of box. But I would say that, like we, we have a lot of procedures internally and how we can actually export those procedures to the, to the whole community. Uh, and that, you know, and, and related to procedures, like the, the, the importance is that you follow them. So mo most of the procedures are related to code review and how we do code review and how we build test cases and test suits. So some of them is, is very relatively easy to apply, such as like creating test cases and also you need to know what you're testing and what you need to find out, but also kind of like those review processes, like how we ensure that people who are building code and reviewing each other's code, uh, how they're doing it uh, well enough. And that's kind of like part of also like education, I, I guess that we were able to educate our community and, and the whole DeFi community in general, like how to build secure, uh, uh, secure protocols.